welcome everyone to this uh, this talk. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, it's a nice weather outside, so I'm really happy that you are here instead of enjoying the nice weather outside. Um, this uh, talk is a bit different than uh, some other talks at this conference because it's uh, also about infrastructure security and self application security. Uh, however, these things are converging, as I will show in this talk, and um, yeah, I will show that software defined infrastructures. Um, do have many advantages in terms of security, but uh, yeah, things can go also wrong. So if you don't do things correctly, then things can go horribly wrong. Uh, my name is uh, Theodor Scholte, and um, I've prepared this presentation together with my co-worker, Thomas Kraus. He's our expert on, uh, on Puppet and Infrastructure as Code. Um, unfortunately, he could not uh, attend this uh, conference uh, because he had other commitments. Um, so let me introduce uh, a little bit myself. Um, I'm a software security consultant at the Software Improvement Group, uh, which is an Amsterdam-based uh, consulting firm focusing on software quality. Uh, we look at uh, systems from different angles. Uh, so uh, we look at uh, maintainability, but also uh, security. And we see a lot of different systems uh, every year, um, and uh, also software-defined infrastructure systems. Uh, so that's probably why I'm, I'm, uh, I'm here today. Um, um, so we conduct secure design reviews, secure code reviews, and uh, in my spare time, I really like to hack and code. Uh, previously, I was uh, employed by, uh, by SAP, the German ERP manufacturer. Uh, I was a member of the uh, product security response team. Um, and I was uh, responsible there for handling security issues rolling and rolling out um, security patches to SAP customers so that um, customers could run secure SAP solutions. I also used to be a security researcher uh, and uh, yeah, I've got a PhD in, uh, in web security. Um, and in my spare time, I also like to uh, um, actively work on mitigating uh, risks, although not security risks. With more safety risks, risks I like to climb. Um, but actually, I'm really interested in who are you? So, who of you is operating in a software defined infrastructure structure, uh, is using Puppet, uh, this kind of stuff? Who is here? Who is working here with security? A bit more people? Good. Uh, and who is concerned about security? And who is concerned about the security of their SDI? Ah, good, good that you're here today. So let's continue uh, first uh, with explaining, uh, yeah, classic infrastructures. Um, well, traditionally, um, an, uh, a system administrator had to had to deploy an, uh, an um, yeah, a an system manually by uh, yeah, getting a piece of bare metal, installing an operating system on it, then uh, installing different uh, services on top of it, so a web server, a DNS server, then uh, he had manually to deploy a web application on that web server, and so on. Um, well, you can imagine that this is a lot of manual work and this does not scale. Um, um, you need to install every time individual servers and yeah, imagine if you have to manage thousands of servers, that doesn't work. But it has also uh, poor testing uh, abilities. It's pretty difficult actually to uh, set up a completely exact environment and then uh, do, do uh, testing on, uh, on that infrastructure. And uh, yeah, with manually configuring servers, uh, it's also really hard to track changes, right? I mean, uh, it's, uh, over, it's um, a system administrator um, manually reconfigures the system. Uh, and uh, after reboot, um, um, yeah, you may imagine that after reboot, uh, certain settings have been changed uh, and you are not aware of, and then the system fails. And uh, yeah, that's a, that's a problem. Um, well, with so software-defined infrastructure, um, yeah, everything is your system configurations and what you run on the system is um, defined in code and in configurations, and uh, then this, this code and this configuration is stored ideally in a version control system, such as SVN or Git, 
and um, then you have tools to, uh, that allow you to run the code. So Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Terraform, uh, these tools. And by executing the code, um, yeah, you either get uh, an, uh, an end number of new systems or you get an end number of refreshments of the configuration uh, settings. And what's really important to note is that, uh, yeah, since it's actually software development, uh, building up an infrastructure, um, yeah, it's it's just software development building and maintain, maintaining an SDI. So you need to establish requirements, design and engineer the solution, and define what is generic functionality, uh, what is specific functionality. You need to write maintainable and secure code, and you need to do testing. Um, so how does an SDI uh, look like? So key elements in, uh, in a typical SDI architecture are uh, a provisioning system and the configuration management system. Uh, the provisioning system um, pulls a piece of code in configuration uh, from the version control system, uses that code uh, to invoke an, uh, a cloud API uh, such as the, the API of Amazon AWS or Heroku or Google Cloud. And um, by invoking the API, uh, the administrator uh, can spin up a number of instances. Well, an instance runs an agent, a configuration agent, uh, which pulls uh, um, the configuration for the machine and the, and the code uh, from a configuration management system. And uh, the configuration management system um, pulls um, it from the version control. Um, well, th there are many different variations of this architecture. So sometimes uh, configuration management and, and provisioning are combined in one system. So uh, you have a, a typical setup can be that you have Puppet for both configuration management and provisioning. Uh, but yeah, sometimes that different tools are used, for example, uh, Terraform for provisioning and then Puppet for configuration management. Um, and another variation could be uh, that you don't have a centralized configuration management system, but you have it installed locally on your instance, and you're yourself responsible for, for distributing uh, the, the code and configurations to the instances. So there are clearly some, uh, some different variations of this architecture. Um, yeah, SDI has many advantages for, uh, for security. Um, so, First of all, you can define a security baseline uh, for, a, for, a, for a machine and then, uh, yeah, deploy that multiple times uh, and then you can enforce, you can build a secure baseline and enforce common security settings everywhere. So like, for example, disabling this, the SSH2 protocol on all machines. Uh, so that's, that's a nice thing. Um, you can configure security rules based on the role of the machine. So for example, if you have a database server, you can uh, you can say like, okay, for all databases, da database servers, I only want to have the firewall port open for um, uh, for the database uh, server. Uh, you can do automated uh, security and compliance testing of all your systems with tools such as RSpec, ServerSpec, or InSpec. There will be an excellent uh, and there will be an excellent talk uh, on this subject uh, by Christoph Hartmann later in this conference. And um, yeah, you can also deploy security patches faster. Um, uh, since everything is automated, you can have faster recovery after a compromise of a machine. And yeah, you can demonstrate compliance because with version control, you can um, identify, you can determine who changed what uh, configuration and which changes were made to the configuration. Um, unfortunately, um, yeah, SDI is also a very powerful instrument. It runs it is used actually to configure and run your infrastructure. It's really, really a core thing. So um, I sometimes say that, um, so you run everything from a single code base and sometimes I say SDI is like a baby with a chainsaw. Uh, it's, it's a very powerful instrument. And yeah, then the challenge becomes like, um, yeah, how to prevent that the SDI itself becomes the attack factor. Um, that's, uh, that's, an, that's, uh, that's what I'm going to try to answer in this talk um, by showing a number of common security issues that are typically overlooked uh, after observing 
after analyzing uh, an, uh, a number of uh, software-defined infrastructures in the past uh, few years. Um, so let me go back to this, uh, this overview um, of, uh, of an architecture of a software-defined infrastructure. Um, basically, um, there are three things that I want to focus on in this talk. It's uh, insufficiently protected interfaces of the config code and configuration management system and the cloud APIs, um, insecure handling of secrets, and uh, remote code inclusion. Uh, of course, this is non-exhaustive. There are a lot of other things you can uh, you have to do to make a secure uh, SDI. Of course, you need to harden the configuration management and the provisioning environments. You need to do server hardening on the instance. But yeah, due to the time, I can only focus on these three uh, three issues. Um, so. What I've discovered over the, in a couple of uh, assignments uh, related to, uh, to, uh, to SDI is that, um, that interfaces of the code and uh, of the version control systems and the cloud APIs are, are often insufficiently protected. So we found that the cloud API is invoked at root accounts. Um, the code and configuration repository doesn't have authentication, no access control, weak passwords. Or um, yeah, no uh, role-based, no access control on it, and yeah, the argumentation is like yeah, um, this uh, version control system, yeah, it's just a, a backend system, so we don't need to secure it. Well, of course, you have the uh, the insider threat that someone, um, uh, some malicious user in your organization or so a disgruntled employee, uh, yeah, wants to uh, wants to do bad things and uh, changes uh, system configurations can still. Uh, but you, you can also have um, yeah, external entities like external attackers that try first to compromise an, uh, an instance and by uh, <coughs> after having compromised the instance, uh, yeah, the attacker then tries to uh, make changes in, uh, in the version control system. Uh, and since that, uh, the code in that version control system is uh, used uh, yeah, to configure and run your infrastructure, uh, yeah, the guy might... Uh, yeah, still cloud capacity, get access to production data, um, manipulate the in infrastructure, including shutdown of resources, all this kind of bad stuff can then happen. Um, well, a third issue is, uh, is insecure handling of secrets. Um, so one of the primary strengths of a configuration management system is that it works with re a re uh, reusable code. So code that... Um, has many purposes, also needs to be configured. And um, yeah, in a typical code base, you find modules for each different uh, application running on an instance. So for example, you have for MySQL, you have then a module uh, for, for, for uh, let's say, installing uh, MySQL, and then also a piece of configuration for configuring the, the, the um, uh, Configuring the MySQL server, for example, the number of maximum allowed connections, um, uh, the, the, number, the port the number the server is running on, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so specifically, if you focus on Puppet, uh, yeah, you have uh, Eura data, which is the configuration data. Configuration settings are expressed in Eura data and GEMO files, and yeah, a Puppet the code, the Puppet code is then stored in, uh, in manifest files. And what we often see in uh, our design and code reviews is actually that the configuration file just contains password. Like, uh, this, is, this is an example of, uh, of um, an anonymized example of, where an, um, um, of a configuration for, uh, for a web application which uh, accesses a, a database server and uh, yeah, this configuration file just contains the clear text password uh, to access that database server, which is really a bad thing um, because um, yeah, it's just like writing a password on a piece of paper, putting it on your machine, uh, on your uh, next to your keyboard, uh, yeah, to remember your password. But yeah, with configurations uh, in SDI, um, yeah, these sensitive information, these credentials are, sto are uh, stored in version control. Many users do typically have access to this version control system. And uh, yeah, it also maintains a, a long history. 
Um, so yeah, it's a really bad thing. And fortunately, uh, there exist solutions uh, to prevent that. So um, one way to do that is encrypt configuration values. So uh, with, uh, with Puppet, uh, configuration values are, uh, are stored in the, in the Europe backend. And there, for Puppet, there exist multiple different uh, backends. Uh, for example, a REST backend, but also a YAML file backend. Um, a REST backend, uh, MySQL, PostgreSQL backends. And you can also write your own uh, custom backend. And there also exists a backend um, for storing um, encrypted uh, configuration uh, settings, which is called the EAML uh, backend. So then the, um, and then the idea is actually to, uh, to store the, uh, to, f to create the pa database passwords and um, encrypt it using uh, the private key that's installed on the, uh, on the configuration uh, uh, server, um, using the public key, sorry, to encrypt the configuration. And uh, yeah, then you can store it in version control and the configuration management tool can decrypt it up on the fly when there's a configuration change. And um, yeah, this password is then um, transferred to the instance uh, using a TLS, uh, using TLS protocol. So that's a way uh, to, have, to deal with, uh, with secrets. Um, but then there's still the issue that uh, a lot of configuration management tools actually lock uh, configuration changes. Um, on the, so if a configuration change, uh, if the configuration on a particular instance changes, then, um, um, then the change, uh, the change value is, uh, is locked. And yeah, this is a problem if, if the configuration um, file uh, contains a, a, a secret, like a database password. And uh, yeah, what you see typically in logging setups is that the, the logged information ends up in many places uh, in the end. So first it's going to sit log and then to your seam system. And um, yeah, that's, that's uh, then you don't have any more control over where uh, your logged information, yeah, where secrets ends up. Uh, so you need to be very careful with logging configurations, uh, with logging changes of configuration files. Uh, fortunately, uh, also many configuration management tools have ways to uh, yeah, avoid uh, logging of configuration content. Um, in any case, uh, having um, Having uh, yeah credentials of, of services in your uh, configurations um, uh, has also a, a number of other challenges. Like um, what you typically want is actually that you rotate the credentials, right? I mean that you uh, over time that, for example, the, the database account on the database server, uh, yeah, that the password is not uh, it changes over time. Um, well. Many organizations do not have a, uh, have a policy for that, uh, or they do have a policy, but then the change process is actually very complicated, resulting in that the password, passwords never change. So one way to avoid that is um, using actually long, uh, long uh, is to avoid long living credentials altogether with, with dynamic credentials. And servers such as a HashiCorp uh, Vault uh, can do that. It creates a sub account with credentials for particular servers like uh, um, MySQL, PostgreSQL, but also uh, Amazon and AWS is supported. Then these credentials expire after the lease period. And it also means that um, yeah, the credential needs to be renewed on time. Um, because uh, if it's not renewed, then uh, yeah, that leads to authentication failure. And then your web application making use of, of a database account doesn't work anymore. So uh, for that, uh, the control flow of, let's say, updating those passwords is typically incompatible with configuration management tools. So you need a separate process on the instance to uh, update these, uh, these uh, passwords and configuration files. And the uh, tool uh, to do that is a console template. Well, the third issue that, uh, is typically, that is quite common is the inclusion of, uh, of untrusted code. Uh, strictly speaking, um, 
Docker is not necessarily part of an SDI, but it's often uh, used in combination with, uh, with an SDI. And it's a container technology, right? So uh, with, this technology, with this technology, you can um, deploy applications in, uh, in containers. And, um, um, and to do that, uh, yeah, Docker uses uh, to build Docker images, to build these containers. Um, Docker reads, uh, reads and executes instructions from, uh, from a Docker file. And uh, this is an example actually from uh, from Docker Hub. Docker Hub is a is a let's say an ecosystem a platform where you can uh, thanks um, where you um, can download um, yeah Docker files which which setups uh, then a container for you. And uh, yeah, what is if you if you browse through uh, through Docker Hub, uh, yeah, what you then come across is like these, this kind of files where, uh, yeah, an install script is just downloaded using curl, then it's piped and executed, and yeah, how how do you know that this? How can you trust this? How can you trust this this web server that it has not been compromised? That the install script has not been has not been altered by a malicious user. Um, so there's no way actually to do a, a verification. Uh, on, uh, for example, checksum uh, to to check for the integrity of uh, of the of the installer or the packages, like what you normally do have with uh, Ubuntu packages, Debian packages, but also um, and, uh, build management systems, dependency management systems, uh, like Maven do that have have that. So this is really an example of convenience over security, right? It is really easy to just download the script from the internet and execute it. Well, fixing uh, SDI security structurally. Um, um, well, as I said earlier, developing and maintaining an SDI is, is really like normal software development. Um, so, um, what you also have seen in other talks is, uh, yeah, is the concept of a secure development lifecycle, uh, where you, which is essentially, um, um, yeah, a software development lifecycle with uh, with the usual steps like uh, establishing requirements, doing design, coding, verification, with the addition of certain security activities, and uh, like uh, establishing secure requirements, uh, trap model activities, uh, code reviews, um, security testing, and what is yeah to address um, SDI security structurally, your SDLC secure SDLC also needs to cover your your SDI instead of just your normal uh, web applications. So um, one interesting thing to look at is code review. Uh, with code review, um, yeah, you can kind of uh, analyze the code and find security issues. So here are a few examples which you can use to detect um, remote code inclusion, two more permissive file uh, permissions, passwords and secrets in files. Um, and yeah, you, what is uh, important is that you need, do, not, do not only need to look at your own code that you have written yourself, but also uh, code by external parties, provide by external parties. Um, so you have these ecosystems where you just download, um, where you can install uh, pre-configured, or not pre-configured, but you can install um, uh, you can download uh, modules from Code Modules, Puppet Forge, Chef Supermarket, Docker Hub. Uh, yeah, you either need to trust them or you need to uh, review the code uh, to detect security issues in there. So to summarize, uh, I'm running out of time. Um, SDI, um, yeah, it has many advantages uh, to improve the security of your uh, your landscape. It can also become an uh, attack, to, attack factor itself if not done properly. <coughs> Common security issues that are typically overlooked are, uh, of course, great access control or um, insufficiently protected interfaces, uh, insecure handling of secrets, remote code inclusion, and yeah, to address security structurally, uh, you need to include it in your uh, SCLC. Thank you very much. Yeah, are there any questions? Yeah, that's yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there any uh, tools for automation of this process of uh, checking if uh, any 
Yeah, there are, there are a number of um, number of tools. So one of them is uh, is GitLeaks for uh, that can analyze automatically uh, Git repositories. Um, well, the interesting thing is actually all, that all these issues are pretty simple issues, right? I mean, you don't need a full-blown static analysis tool to uh, to detect them. Um, but uh, so yeah, another uh, thing actually to check, let's say, the hardening of your infrastructure is is uh, to make use of uh, Inspec, uh, which is a uh, yeah a testing tool for uh, for Chef. Um, and yeah, there will be a tool. Uh, we will we'll talk about that later on uh, in this conference. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.